So we're here to talk about um, public art, uh, which is a wonderful thing. Um, and the public art we're going to uh, talk about um, is located uh, on the unceded territories of the Squamish peoples, the tsleil peoples, and the Musqueam peoples. And as a predominantly uh, settler population, we're incredibly uh, honored and grateful to be here, uh, to be able to enjoy this wonderful place where we are. And we can take action uh, to show that gratitude by uh, taking actions in preserving and taking care of this beautiful land that we're on and by supporting uh, our hosts and our neighbors and every member of our community. Part of, in doing that, uh, is art. Art does that. Art uh, supports people, brings people up, raises awareness, uh, and tells stories. And that's what public art does. It tells a story of place. Uh, because public art is uh, artwork that is specifically planned, executed, and displayed so that it is accessible to everyone uh, while reflecting the culture, heritage, and natural surroundings of the area. Uh, to create and enhance a sense of place. And that is what we are uh, gonna talk a little bit about today and how all of that happens. Uh, so I guess we'll start with introductions. Uh, hello, uh, my name is Steven Snyder. I am the Gallery and Communications Coordinator for the West Vancouver Community Arts Council. Uh, we're a not-for-profit uh, in West Vancouver. You probably have been to some of our events at our headquarters, the Silk Purse Arts Center. And my co-host this evening will be Taryn Urquhart. Hi guys, uh, I'm in front of a lovely picture of the West Van, no, it's over here, what, no, oh, there we go, <laughs> West Vancouver Memorial Library. Uh, we miss you all, uh, keep updated uh, on our website for any uh, upcoming news about when we're opening, fingers crossed, maybe end of June, July, fingers crossed. Um, I'm the Arts and Special Events Programmer here at the library, I look after all things music and art. And I have the privilege of introducing our panelists today. And I'm going to run through just kind of some quick slides um, showing a very small, uh, brief picture of the, the work of these amazing artists, Mary and Richard, who hasn't yet been able to join us. Hopefully he'll log on shortly. Um, their their uh, portfolios are so vast that we're just going to focus on a few of their little their uh, pieces that you can see around the North Shore. So I just want to do a quick plug for this amazing tool uh, that went live uh, probably right before the pandemic hit, um, the North Shore Culture Compass. Uh, it is an amazing free online map and resources that was spearheaded mainly by North Vancouver Arts. Um, it combines rich cultural landmarks, both physical and virtual, across the North Shore. It includes the Squamish Nation, the tsleil Nation, the City and District of North Vancouver, and the West Van District. And I am going to, hopefully, uh, they have just put up on their YouTube channel, and when I say they, I mean the North Shore Culture Compass, this fabulous little video on how to find public art uh, and use this tool. I've muted it um, and I will include this link to a resource list that I'll send out to all participants if you registered. And uh, just a fabulous tool uh, that um, talks about our festivals, our events, our public art. If you have a chance to go online and just explore this, um, I highly recommend it. Anything, um, Stephen or Laura, you'd like to say about the fabulous Culture Compass? Um, well, I can say that, you know, North Van, um, you know, Public Art Program has been very involved in this. We've provided all the data for the, um, for the map. And so we're trying to keep it as up to date as possible as well. So. Um, I think it's just a really interesting tool um, that really just uh, shows, you know, the whole of the North Shore, which is really great. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I, it's such a robust um, tool that I haven't yet gone into all the little nuances of it, but um, 
I think the more we get used to using it and spreading the word around the uh, community will be great. Yeah. So next slide. <laughs> so our, our first panelist I want to introduce is Lori Phillips. Um, she is our, our, she is the public art officer at the North Vancouver Rec and Culture Commission. She is currently responsible for administering the civic developer and community public art programs for both the North Vancouver municipalities, so both the city and the district, where the public art inventory has grown from 25 pieces to 150 public artworks under her leadership. Round of applause. Um, I can't believe how many pieces of public art there are in uh, North Vancouver. In fact, West Van is a little envious, Lori, I have to say. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I, we just putting up this slide to show you just a, a few of them. I think the camel is probably my favorite on 13th and Lonsdale. He, Very uh, good. Very good. Yeah, is it a he or a she? I'm, oh, definitely a she. Yes. Okay. She did have a, a safety mask on for a few weeks and then it disappeared, but I enjoyed that. Um. Uh, I also, Lori believes that public art is a distinctive cultural asset that provides a deep rooted sense of place and serves as an artistic legacy for future generations. Uh, so she's also provided just a few snapshots here. Whatever the weather, I don't even know where this one is. Lori, where is this? Um, yeah, so I was just providing an example of something that people don't normally maybe see easily or uh, recognizably as public art. It's one of our newer pieces. It's on the Green Necklace Pathway, which is a multi-use pathway that runs through the city of North Vancouver, sort of in the middle, sort of the core of the city. And um, we had asked an artist to, to come up with something that would unite the whole pathway. And uh, Mia Weinberg, who's a local Vancouver artist, came up with this idea of um, putting these stamps um, on the pathway. So the whole pathway is about five miles long and there's all these different stamps that help people recognize either themselves or their neighbors or just see sort of fun images. So the favorite is the T-Rex. Yeah. So you encounter first one man, you can see the little picture above you, you encounter one man, you walk along, you see two men and then you walk along, you see three men and then eventually you see these three guys running because they're running from the dinosaur. So she has these little stories to to sort of help you kind of uh, be more engaged with the with the environment as you're walking around on the pathway. It's a it's a really fun project. Yeah, I love how they're so normal and everyday and yet so creative. They're and then I am familiar with this one. I have a friend that lives at the bottom of Lonsdale and we walk past this a lot. Um, so this is, uh, it's off of Esplanade, I believe. Yes, this one's um, one. I, I, I brought this one up as a, just a really great example of sort of almost kind of traditional public art. It's a sculpture, you know, it's what people expect to see as public art. It's uh, entitled Launch by Elizabeth Roy. And uh, what I really love about it is that when we talk about public art, we always talk about it telling stories. And this piece, well, it just looks like an interesting sculpture. It really tells the story of place. And if I may, I might just read what it says on the sign there. It says, this sculpture acknowledges the site's transformation from a workplace for men and women who pioneered the community, which is the shipyards and the shipbuilding area in Lower Lonsdale, to a place for the next generation to build upon. So the bottom is a domestic vessel, a vase, something we're very common and um, familiar with in, in our homes. So that's the domestic part of the site, the new, all the new, uh, you know, apartment buildings. And then it's holding this uh, sort of bouquet that includes a ship vessel, which alludes to the history of the past use of the site. So I just thought it's just, it's just such a lovely combination. It just tells a beautiful story. You can see it as a sculpture when you first encounter it, but you know, upon, you know, deeper sort of investigation, you see, you see that it is telling a story that's very specific to that location. So, so it's one that a lot of people don't necessarily notice or think about. And it's, 
that whole shipyards area is getting very, very active now. So it's very close to that area. So if anyone's in that area, uh, you know, in, you know, their next, their, their travels, they should, you know, pop by and see this one. It is right on Esplanade on the, um, on the uh, east side of Lonsdale. Thank you. Well, um, I think we're going to touch upon that topic of place a lot in the next hour, because I know it runs through all of the pieces that we're bringing up. Um, so thank you, Lori. Uh, our next panelist is the fabulous, why is my thing not working now? <laughs> oh, right before we go into our next panel, I also wanted to mention Lori, um, this fabulous resource that I believe you said is getting reprinted yet again, the public art map um, that you can pick up usually at most of our, you know, libraries, community centers and whatnot but hopefully we'll be able to access that again soon. Yes, that's correct. Yep, it, it will be reprinted this year. Great. So our second panelist, I'd like to introduce um, Mary Tassie Baker. Um, I've included this picture along with her uh, partner, Wade Baker. I had the privilege of working uh, with both of them quite closely on a piece of art that was installed in the West Vancouver Library. Um, Mary has been uh, in the field of urban planning and community engagement for over 20 years. And now along with Wade, who's a First Nation storyteller, artist, Carver, they are part of the team that makes up Sky Spirit Studios. And they recently published um, this book, we have it in the library, plug, plug, um, The Hidden Journals, Captain Vancouver and His Map Maker. Um, I've read it, really enjoyed it. Um, this is a picture of the panel we made for one of the meeting rooms in the West Vancouver Library. It's called Panel of Knowledge, uh, and it represents the Thai salmon and ulukan, and we, we lit it from behind, which we're very excited about. Um, I want to mention that uh, Sky Spirit Studio uh, their approach to public art is to bring forward a historical sense of place that captures the complexity of historical timelines from the past and brings them into the present. Um, many collaborations and making the art give it meaning to many diverse groups and any given community. Hope I said that kind of correctly. This is one of my favorite pieces, not far from uh, the piece that Lori was just speaking to. Uh, this is, um, I'm forgetting the title. Oh my gosh, Gateway to Ancient Wisdom. Um, down beside the key, um, beside Mosquito Creek. Um, Mary, when was this installed? Um, this was installed in 2009. It was part, it was the first section of the Spirit Trail. So I could talk more about it now or later. What? You know, yeah, it, it was quite an incredible project. It's won several design awards. I think the Canadian Society of Landscape Architects, Design Excellence Awards for Public Art and the Urban Planning. It's about a half a kilometer walk, which, which so this is the first, was the first section. It's two Thunderbirds and a Sun. And um, then as you go through the trail, it's a winding trail. There's six benches with 28 bronze discs in mm -hmm. them. And, uh, and it was an incredible project. It was the first collaboration between the Squamish Nation and the city of North Vancouver. Lori was representing um, public art um, for the city district and then Cheryl Rivers um, for the Squamish Nation. And then Wade and I were the artist mentors. And um, basically I managed all the community engagement. We had elders, we had youth workshops. Um, it's just was an incredible project. This is one of the pieces. Some of them are by Wade and our daughter, who's now joined Sky Spirit Studio and Consulting. Some of them are from other artists. Uh, they've all gone on. Simone Siept uh, went to Emily Carr. So it was really an incredible um, collaborative project involving the community, and we're and we're still very proud of it. Yeah, it's one of my favorite walks now. Uh, you can all go all the way from the shipyards along the Spirit Trail and all the way over to the Auto Mall. And then you just come across these little, these little nuggets and jewels of art. Uh, 
Thank you, Lori and Mary, for bringing those along the waterfront. Um, and then uh, this was another piece that I don't know too well, Mary, but I know this is in Calgary um, and also on uh, the traditional Blackfoot foot territory. Is that correct? Yeah, this was a really, really um, innovative project as well. We were called in by the city of Calgary in 2015 um, basically because the, uh, they wanted to, as part of the river mythology project, they wanted to engage the Blackfoot uh, Nation in, in the community art project and the Blackfoot Nation was refusing to um, meet with the city. And it was at a, the whole thing was at a complete standstill. And we were brought in and uh, the public art officer at the time for Calgary um, was a very forward thinking person and she allowed us the time and space to take time and do respect respectful protocols with the Blackfoot, which took about three months of time. We had a river blessing and then we basically brought the Blackfoot together with the, the Inglewood community and the public art piece evolved out of that process. And it was about a six to eight month process total. And they, the city said to us, if whatever comes out of this process, they're open to it. Maybe it's a video, maybe it's a book. And what ended up happening was um, this incredible 30 foot diameter labyrinth with um, wording from the community and the Blackfoot. And it was the first time the Blackfoot had allowed some of their wording to be uh, engraved into a public art piece. So it was, it was an absolutely incredible project as well. So yeah, I can talk more about it later. Right. It, yeah, it's amazing. And it, the size does allow you to walk the labyrinth, correct? Yes. And yeah. what was interesting is they do a lot of night events there, which surprised me because Calgary can be, it can be really hot in the summer for any of you who've been in Calgary, but it can get extremely cold really fast. And so, um, so we did the actual launch of the walk with Mayor Nenshi, who is an amazing mayor. Uh, at night, and at one point, for some reason, I just could not see. I don't know, we had candles, you know, around it, and all these people were following behind me, and the mayor was right behind me, and suddenly I just, I don't know what happened, it just blacked out, and I couldn't see, and he immediately took out his cell phone, and he was behind me, and, and shone the light, and I remember thinking, now that's why he's the mayor, right? <laughs> he just immediately knew what to do. I love that. So I can't see my screen. Do we have a Richard yet? Yes, Richard is here. Woo! Great. <laughs> Great. I have appeared. Um, I've appeared. Technology got in the way. So, <laughs> hey. Yeah, here now. I had a day like that yesterday. I completely understand. So Richard, whoop, Richard has joined us. Um, I'll go back to the screen so everyone can see him in a moment. But um, Richard is based out of Strathcona, Vancouver. Uh, he has been a muralist, a printmaker, an artist, uh, I believe since the late 1970s. Uh, his murals, which I'm just beginning to realize are all over West Van and the city, and I keep coming upon them, are so expressive, full of color, movement. This one I didn't know was Richard's, and I see it in the West Van um, City Hall all the time. It's behind the administration desk. Um, and I included another slide here. Um, Stephen, did you know that these were Richard's? I, yes. I actually installed them, so yes, I do know they're there. <laughs> <laughs> they, sorry, I'll, I'll tell you, I can sorry. give you a quick backstory. They were around Lawson Creek Studios. Oh, okay. And so they, it was a larger piece uh, that I was commissioned to do some years back that wrapped around the Lawson Creek Art Studios to um, transform that um, what was a residence into something that looked like an art center. So it, it's uh, actually on marine plywood and it's routered, hand routered and painted with acrylics and sealed and it ran uh, on two sides of the art center. Um, then it went in storage for a while when the art center was decommissioned, um, that particular one. So we kept the panels and they were removable and then I, um, Glenn Madsen from the city public art uh, asked me if there was any way they could be re 
imagined in a new space, namely the new city hall, which had no art in it. And so I re, uh, reconfigured them and took kind of two elements and linked them together. So um, yeah, yeah. So that's how that yeah. ended up being there. I think they work so well in that space, um, which this kind of large wall. And I really enjoy seeing them every time I go in there. Um, we are also fortunate to have your work um, on the side of the Silk Purse Art Center. Stephen, do you got? Do you have anything to say to these? Yeah, they are fantastic pieces. It was a, a wonderful project um, that we worked with Richard on, and it was he really captured the essence of what happens in in the Silk Purse and the and the music box with all of the music and art and its connection to uh, to nature. Uh, it was they're really wonderful pieces that really bring out the spirit of of what happens in those two centers. Yeah, and then um, Stephen, you can speak. I just chose two murals um, that's spoke to me I, um, that you sent me the other day. Uh, the one on the left is chimney, no, is radius from the Fire Hall yeah, Art Center. Yeah. And the one on the right is through the eye of the Raven, the Vancouver native housing in Vancouver. And I know you do, um, same with Mary, a lot of collaborative um, pieces often with minority groups, Japanese, Chinese, First Nations, um, any, short message you'd like to say here? Well, I, yeah, just a little bit of the background on uh, the, I put these two um, pieces in because they were true collaborations in a very kind of broad reaching way. <clears throat> the one on the left, um, because the art centers at Gore and uh, Cordova, it really is historically a confluence of um, three cultural groups that have made their mark there. Um, First Nations, obviously, and uh, Chinese and Japanese communities. So we thought we'd take that nexus of the three communities and forge it into one piece that brought the three together by working with artists. And then we also mentored some younger artists, um, Marissa Nahani and uh, two others on, on mural painting in the process of doing it. So it was a really excellent um, multi-dimensional project with a lot of workshops in the community and in the Japanese language center and the Chinese cultural center and such as well. So I won't go into all the iconography, but it does represent a significant event uh, after the fire of Vancouver where um, First Nations came across in canoes and rescued people from the shores of Vancouver. And so that's symbolized by the four paddles also that represent four directions and the canoe that has text written through it, if you see it up close. Um, so that's kind of was a key starting point. So I like taking, you know, elements like that, that maybe have a historical context and then and then it, it sort of um, spirals out of there into something much more like a tapestry um, with words and and I, I, other imagery as well. The other one, uh, Through the Eye of the Raven, was uh, uh, from the start was meant to be First Nations, uh, urban First Nations that we worked with um, throughout, as well, uh, five artists from the community, um, and uh, as well as had uh, several brainstorming sessions with uh, different, different um, uh, First Nations groups to come up with imagery and a general kind of series of concepts. It's uh, like 8,000 square foot mural, so it's the largest one I had taken on. Um, and most of us, in fact, had never worked on swing stage, so that was a lot of fun, hanging off the wall all summer, painting that uh, six stories high and uh, 150 feet long. Oh, they're, they're absolutely so, uh, beautiful. beautiful, absolutely beautiful. Yeah, and thank you. Just, yeah, it's... it's yeah. Um, you know, it has to be photographed from a drone or something because it's hard to see it. <laughs> but you, one can see it from different directions of the city as well, pretty clearly. Okay. And we yes. Will, yeah. Can you, anyway. so can you see all of our faces again? Yes. Yes. And just for everyone um, tuning in, I will be sending out a resource list listing um, all of the artists, um, their websites, and some more resources such as um, the murals of Vancouver and the fabulous walking tours you can take. There's so many um, tools out there and I'll try and um, put them all together. So thank you for my little snippet. Uh, Stephen, I'll hand it over to you now. 
Excellent. That's awesome. Um, and I've just put up behind me, um, this is a shot of the silk purse with Richard's two murals on it, um, which are pretty great. And I, I miss seeing the space and seeing all of the wonderful public art and the nature around it. Can't wait to get back. So um, those were all wonderful statements, everyone. Um, you touched on a lot, of the, a lot of the things we wanted to get to this evening, uh, which was great. Um, so uh, let's see. I'm just going to reorganize some things a little bit here. Uh, let's see. Okay. So, um, Richard and Mary, you both talked a little bit, a little bit about, um, collaboration and Lori as well. Um, so how, how, how important is, um, is collaboration to you with, with the local communities, um, that you work with and, and how does that affect, uh, sort of the design process and the creation process, um, uh, of creating works and where uh, and where these uh, and where these spaces go based upon this community uh, consultation and collaboration. Um, I suppose uh, Mary, if you want to start speaking to that, that would be great. Um, that's a really interesting question, and and you know, looking at it through the public art lens, I know that about 10, 15 years ago. Um, you know, there was this thought out there and, and I was coming from a very strong urban planning background, right? Where you have to engage the community, it's a legal obligation. So that's, okay, that's my lens anyway. But about 10 to 15 years ago, you know, that just was not done. It was actually called plunk art. You know, people would often, um, you know, developers, I believe even at that time, they had to do 5% go into public art. That's been around for a while. Often they would hire someone from outside the area and they would put something in the lobby or outside the building. So, you know, this, this strong collaborative approach started about 10 or 15 years ago, I would say. And there was this myth out there in the public art world that that meant bad art, you know, or that meant low quality art, which is completely untrue from my point of view. It, it, that's what you can create actually really visionary pieces because people will rise to the occasion. Um, I'm sure Richard can share about this. It's absolutely amazing what happens when I let go of my control or my idea of what it should be. And the Calgary example was a perfect example of that, you know, where I went in there and it was like, nobody was talking to anybody, you know, and, and I remember walking along the Bull River for days and they actually had signs. They had hired a public artist from Hamilton before, just before we got there. This is in Calgary. And there were signs on the river saying things like, the river is angry. You know, and, and this public artist had gotten $30,000 to put three signs out saying the river is angry. And the, the flood had happened just a year before. So that's what I was walking into. So, you know, I completely let go of, of uh, you know, Wade and I completely, he tends to do more of the art and I tend to do more of the urban design public engagement. I had to completely let go of any of my stereotypes, preconceptions, and just allow things to evolve. I mean, the Blackfoot elder we worked with had never even been in a, in a, in a white home, a settler home in the community. So, you know, just, just to bring those people together for a coffee or breakfast. And at that time also it was, this is indigenous art. You know, that, you know, that's over here, you know, right? Mm -hmm. And so, so I think when you start working with community, the community actually doesn't think like that. They're very, like Strathcona, I was just there. I, I know you live in Strathcona. Mm -hmm. It's such a diverse community. My other hat is a school board trustee. We have 40 different languages in our schools. So the way the community works is actually at a street level, very diverse and very collaborative. So as a public artist to go in and just allow and facilitate it, I mean, magic happens. So that's my perspective. Exactly. <laughs> Lori, coming uh, from that sort of collaborative re relationship, um, but from kind of the opposite end as the municipal uh, sort of figure putting, putting these projects together, how does that work? How does the municipality decide uh, what sort of projects and artists to collaborate with? Uh, well, I think what's really important in terms of uh, involvement, community involvement, is that when um, we have a public art advisory committee, 
And um, I think that's like our main point of contact with the community is that, you know, people can sign up and they commit to spending a two year term with us to help us uh, to input on every single project that comes through. And there are a lot of projects that come through. And as I'm, you know, managing three different programs, the, um, the goal of each program is a little different. There's projects that are coming, you know, through civic monies and civic dollars. There's projects that are coming through developers and developer programs. And then there's the community public art program, which is, you know, almost, it's 100%. Uh, hands-on with the community so you have these different levels of involvement um, but you know consistently we have our community um, advice our public garden advisory committee and then every project that comes through it's a different uh, set of people that uh, serve as the jury to select the arts so again it's representative of the stakeholders that are close to that project so artists, community members that live in the area, you know, if it's the developer or the owner or the landscape architect who's involved, and they, they get together and they make the decision together. So it, it's very collaborative. I've always said public art, it's not for all artists, and, and, it, and it shouldn't be. It, it's just one type of art that's out there. But I say it's, I've always said it's a meeting of the minds. You've got to be able to bring a bunch of different minds together, planners, artists, community members, to work on a project. And, and um, I really believe in the wisdom of the crowd. In the end, I can't tell you how many times I've sat on a panel thinking, oh, I really like this one, you know. Yet the selection panel will pick something different. And, you know, years later, I think, oh, that was the right choice, you know, because it's a collaborative group, sort of everybody's inputting into the process. And, and generally, uh, you know, it just, it just seems to come out right in the end. Excellent. Yeah. And, uh, Laura, you had mentioned um, public art is not necessarily for every artist. Um, Richard, you were, uh, you are and were uh, a showing gallery artist as well. What was the transition like moving from that into the sort of the public art mural world? Uh, you know, I've never stopped being a studio artist and, a, and a, I show in galleries and I do public art projects and collaborations. I mean, you can't be out on the street all year round in Vancouver, so you gotta take, you gotta be busy elsewise, right? Uh, I've never really stopped. So, I mean, I travel, I do murals, I, you know, I like many things simultaneously, as well as teaching and all of that. So um, it's neither one, it's not, one is not exclusive of the other. And in fact, I find more and more my studio work kind of gives me a segue into some of the public processes that I like going through with the community. So the last few big mural projects that I've done have involved making stencils or doing printmaking and then transcribing that into images that become huge. And so these come from a community process, of course. Uh, so they're just different ways of using mediums, right? Um, so uh, yeah, they feed each other and vice versa. I think my studio work gets in, in influenced by uh, the murals as well because there's a, there's a certain kind of dynamic with mural muralism as we call it right i mean it's about architecture and the architectonic space and activating it that's what's really exciting as well as the fact that you're bringing these multiple voices to it um i think back to what the points mary was making you know it's like yeah the whole thing of process is something that those of us that work in community engaged we've always done that and so it's become kind of a catchphrase now but you know it's just something that is kind of in tandem with our, um, our way of uh, developing ideas and such. That's, you know, we're the conductors, right? Like, as, as you know, we're sort of conducting and we got an orchestra with varying skills and various abilities and various instruments. Um, but how do we bring that all together in a kind of like, almost like a crash course of um, bringing people together on one kind of main focus or several ideas that can coalesce into a into a public piece. So that's what's exciting about it. And I mean, you know, when you go to a proposal or make a proposal, you don't really know, you can't say this is the final piece because you're basically selling your jury on the idea or the 
of how you're going to go about it. You don't have like a final end product. It's like, yeah, this is, this is how I've done past projects and it'll go this way or it'll go that way. We don't really know. You just have to kind of have some blind faith, you know, make it happen. But that's what a lot of art making is anyway. It's just blind faith, right? Uh, can I share a quick story about that? Mm -hmm. Please. Um, I'm sorry. I keep, I keep picking on Calgary because it, it just was, so we were, so then we decided it was going to be this labyrinth and then we had to find contractors and all very quickly because as of October 10th, the temperature goes down in Calgary and none of the contractors I called were willing to said, no, the city of Calgary takes way too long to pay. No, no, no. And so I stood on the site for two days. I found a bed and breakfast nearby. I basically stood on the site for two days. I had a Starbucks, um, you know, those big containers and Wade set up a table with donuts. And I said, I'm here on the site. It was in the park, public park. And I said, I've got donuts and coffee. And that's talk about blind faith. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and then <laughs> I, we finally found the contractors and, you know, people walk by public art pieces. They have no idea about, you know, all the backstories that go on. And I just, that just, I had to share that when you said blind faith. But it's true. And, <laughs> and that's where the really interesting stuff happens is behind the scenes as it's formulating. And then the end product is the piece. But, you know, they both can be excellent, right? I mean, there, uh, there was, I think you alluded to that too, Mary, that there was this idea that, you know, publicly engaged work is lesser than yeah. somehow. And I think that that's shifting, but um, for a long time, you know, the Community Arts Fund was a little tiny pocket that barely covered anything, you know, whereas um, to do an, I always said, you know what, fund it and we'll do an ambitious community project and it'll be amazing. But you have to put the funding behind it. Uh, so, you know, it's like anything, if you take on technical challenges, it's going to cost some money to do it. But um, yeah believe in the process right so yeah we've all got great stories right and so it's nice to have that kind of documented as well that's always a big part of our um, process is to take videos or you know have, have it recorded so whether it's like the big print project where we were doing four by eight foot wood prints on the street with different artists um, teaching them printmaking driving a steamroller over it to print that's a whole story in itself, right? And so, yeah, taking a little video documentation and then maybe a booklet or some other way that you get the word out about how that, that those pieces came about is very, is very important. A little easier with digital now, but um, yeah, uh, it, it, all, it all adds to the, the layers of, uh, I think, interest of the, of the undertaking. And, um, and then the launch, I was going to mention, the launches are really important. And I'm sure in the projects that you've done, um, we've always had, for example, in the East Side First Nations uh, ceremony, like a very heartfelt, amazing ceremonies with uh, cedar bough blessings of murals. It's like launching a canoe, right? And bannock and, you know, food and celebration and a lot of speeches and, it's all uh, lends substance to that event and and dignifies the piece. Very important as well. So yeah, it goes off in different directions, right? Yeah, and I love the protocols. You know, like our we're a Coast Salish intergenerational practice, and you know, it took a lot of people are a bit afraid to ask questions and I always say you know it took me 20 years to get it so go ahead ask away mm -hmm. you know so just the richness of the protocols and the exactly. story of place yeah. and the cultural oral stories and, and they're just um they're so profound you know and I often say if you're only getting an elder to do an acknowledgement and okay thank you you, you know you're so losing on such richness in the collaborative process right from the start. Um, mm -hmm. And the Coast Salish were such great hosts. You yes. know, they had, they had people here coming from up north down to Mayan territory to the, you know, the settlers who've been here six or seven generations. So, mm -hmm. yeah. um, you know, we've I just, learned, I just we've, we learned so, so much. Rich, from, right? Right? Yeah. I mean, the, for, for us in, in, in Latin America, for example, doing projects there, there's always ceremony around mm -hmm. everything. 
sometimes it goes a little sideways, uh, but uh, you know, there's always like <laughs> music and events. Um, you know, we've been to things where there's poetry readings about the work and uh, you know, it's like you make it into a community celebration. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of it too, you know, stems back in my experience with uh, a lot of big cities in the States have a history of community-based murals that many people might not be too aware of, but we used to track them down all the time whenever we traveled, San Francisco and LA and um, New York and um, a long history. And usually they're, they're based, you know, in different districts where there's kind of disenfranchised communities that find the walls as a good means to express themselves. I mean, even right now with, you know, uh, uh, Floyd and, you know, the, you know, the murals of him popping up everywhere, right? So it's, it's another vehicle to get a message out. And um, yeah, so anyway, big link through Latin America, I find with also with First Nations here kind of ceremony. I noticed you mentioned gallery. Uh, you were a gallery artist, Richard, or are you still doing some gallery work? I still show in galleries and um, yeah, do, you know, easel painting as they call it, right? Mm -hmm. uh, printmaking, particularly. I do a lot of print, printmaking. Um, yeah, Wade stopped yeah. doing gallery work because he's just finding he was being put into a, a box, you know, because he tends to think very big and he's really, that's why he really enjoyed, my partner who's Squamish Nation, he right. really enjoys doing the public art because, yes. you know, he can do really large pieces and he can, um, you know, there's always a call that's interesting somewhere. Uh -huh. Right. Whereas the galleries tend to say, well, this is selling, you know, it has to be this look because this artist is selling. That's what he, we've, he's found in the indigenous uh, gallery world. Mm -hmm. anyway. Yeah, of course. And my work doesn't fit in all galleries, that's for sure. And uh, yeah, you know, and I, you know, I really find too that with artists, like I, I mentioned that only as a side thing that most public artists I've known are also gallery artists. It's just that not every artist is really able to collaborate and I think adapt their work with a crowd you know like some artists are on a trajectory they're just doing something very particular mm -hmm. and it's really important for them to do it I don't think they shouldn't do it you know and they need to very specifically investigate a very specific thing and you know they don't want somebody telling them that it has to be graffiti proof or whatever it is you know kind of thing <laughs> and so you know I just think that you know uh, public artists are really just a certain they have a certain kind of temperament, a certain kind of collaborative kind of, like you can hear it in these two artists when they're talking back and forth. They just enjoy that process. It's, it's just natural for them to, to be able to work with other people and kind of collaborate and bring ideas together into one. So, yeah, no, but I, I think being a public artist does not preclude you from doing Right. All different kinds of things, actually. In fact, very few artists can actually make a whole living on just being a public artist. That's a mm -hmm. difficult. That's a difficult road too. So. Yeah. Yeah, yeah and and in in my experience, I mean, the public art projects are also they're fairly long term. So when so you start one, and it'll be like three years before it's completed. Yes. I've never yes. done that in the studio. It's like I get an idea and I do it. But um, yeah, yeah. It's like you start before the building is dug in the ground. The foundation is laid and yeah. you start a process and you still not finish the public art by the time the building's done so it's an exercise in patience for it sure it's a hurry up and wait kind of a thing right and a hurry lot of logistics and yeah yeah and uh, technical things that have to be worked out i mean that's mm -hmm. which is challenging but can be frustrating too it's funny you just right. said that richard because i was just thinking when laurie was saying how we're we're a unique bunch these public artists um, we did a large mural under the Granville Street Bridge in the summer as part of the Van, Van Mural Fest uh, mm -hmm. last year. And it was all about the sub-trades, <laughs> you know, <laughs> just coordinating the scaffolding and coordinating because there was just a huge traffic go um, mm -hmm. yes. going by. And this narrow sidewalk, so we actually had to have a safety manager on site, you know, work safe safety manager, you know, all these sub trades that, uh, so I'm glad you brought that up about technical expertise because 
I'm certainly not an ex, you know, safety manager. So you wouldn't think, right? Oh, let's go just paint a mural under the bridge. No, you know, no problem. We can do that in a couple of days. Are you kidding? If, it, if, it, <laughs> if, it's, if it's not, if it's not a civic commission, you can maybe do it, right? But if it is, I, I mean, I did a mural with Jerry Whitehead last uh, fall in around the Richmond Arts Center, and it was the same thing. There were certain things had to be done by the painting crew, pressure washing, all of that, and uh, and uh, flagmen for moving uh, genie lift around, right? So it's like, oh, we just go and drive it down the street, you know, but no, you can't really do that. It's just, uh, you know, um, there's too many, uh, too many liability issues. Can, uh, can I chime in and ask Lori a question from kind of the community administrative point of view? Because we've, we've talked about how these pieces are so collaborative and they're a shared experience. And, mm -hmm. and now we're in this strange world of maybe not sharing these spaces in the same way that we do. We can still, you know, go on a public walk and view them, but we're not going to be experiencing art in larger groups at the moment. Do you have any thoughts on that, Lori? From, is it starting to influence your work or how you manage pieces coming up or? Uh, well, you know, it's been such a short window of time. And like Richard said, these are three year projects. So like right now I have to say I've been focused completely on, there's been a lot of projects that are kind of at the end of their third year that are completing right now in my world. So I've been very, very busy with uh, projects that are completing in the last month and a half or two months. But what I have found is people are coming to me, um, um, and, and talking to me a lot about public art because public art is something that uh, once it's done. So one of the things that, you know, in my role, I, I help create and commission artwork, uh, but we also try to program it. So now we've got art. How do we help people enjoy it, engage with it, you know, um, experience it in different ways. And so because you can do that solo, you can do self-guided tours, you can do tours with your little family bubble or your friend's bubble that you know you're safe with. You can do a, a biking, a biking ex, you know, cycling excursion, or you can walk, or you can even, we were talking to somebody, they're feeling really unsafe. You could even do, which we haven't actually developed yet, the other ones are you can find, but uh, actually a car one where, you know, we, what, what are, is really actually quite visible from a vehicle because you don't want to get out and you're a very vulnerable person um, you know that could be another way to to sort of develop a sort of point and 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 observe kind of uh, experience for people um, is so I think public art in and of itself is something that actually can work really well in our sort of COVID world right now our, our social distancing world um, you know, the, the arts that have really suffered, I think, are the ones that are performing arts, you know, that really require a, a group to draw together and, and be together sort of in confined like theater type spaces or, or that kind of thing. So, so luckily, I think um, public art actually holds a lot in terms of the way we can program it to help, you know, easily to in ways that help people can continue to social or physical distance. Yeah, so so yeah, I've actually had people calling me saying, how else can we do it? What else can we do? We want to promote these kinds of things. Uh, one of the classes the North Vancouver Recreation Commission was offering um, over the summer is uh, oh, sort of a, a small group that goes together and they draw public art, you know, or, you know, so they just have a destination, they learn about it and they can creatively express themselves, you know, you, just journaling, but in small groups. So, um, yeah, yeah, I think, I think it's okay for now, yeah. I liked your idea, Lori, of the driving, because uh, my mom's 82, and she's a real traveler, and she said for her birthday, she got in the car and went cruising. So, you know, you yeah. think about, like the cruising, you know, public art, but I just wanted to say on the spirit trail, and, and Taryn mentioned it, our, our work there, those benches and um, are very long and curved, so you could very easily sit three or four, six people, two feet or two meters apart on on those benches, and then look at the bronze discs and things. So there is public art that you could actually sit and 
and view. You can, uh, some people actually have seen them do rubbings of the bronzes or they'll be sketching them. Or, so, so that might be interesting. It's just a thought to, to put together a, a list of public art that you can maybe sit and view it. And Yeah, and I think we're just lucky that we're in this world of, of technology that we're in right now where everybody has a phone that's a computer pretty much uh, in our very affluent part of the world anyways. And, um, you know, so we can still have our advisory body meeting because we meet like this we meet online so we still have community input on everything we can have pa selection panels meet this way uh, we did already do one selection panel during this time which which and we had the artists presenting online it's not quite as good it's so much better to have the person in person presenting but it still worked and it, it, it I just feel so fortunate that that we have this type of technology right now that we can access, use, adapt, figure out how to continue to connect with each other. It might not be exactly the same way, but same, same, but different as they say. Totally. And speaking of connecting and technology, if anyone does have any questions for our panelists, uh, now is the time to uh, type it in because uh, we're getting into the home stretch here. Um, so once again, that's uh, at the bottom of your Zoom panel, there's a little Q&A icon. So you hit that and you type in your question and we will uh, uh, hopefully be able to get to them. We already have one. Um, one of our, our, our mysterious Taryn Urquharts, uh, who <laughs> today, um, asked about the Lawson Creek Center, um, uh, where Richard had originally had those pieces that are uh, now in the West Van City Hall. And just what asking what that center uh, was, um, if you like Richard, I can speak to that. Um, uh, it, was, uh, it was a house, uh, it, it, was, it was originally a seaside cottage um, uh, right next to John Lawson Park uh, that had been converted into sort of a multi-purpose art studio um, for painting and uh, carving and theater rehearsals. Um, it sadly uh, is no longer with us. Um, they had to take it down. Um, uh, but yeah, so Richard, I guess, um, if you're talking about that um, uh, and those pieces, uh, what, what inspired those pieces um, based upon where they had to go? Uh, yeah, it was an interesting challenge because, of course, taking a fairly conventional looking house and trying to make it look, uh, you know, painted up, it wasn't possible to really do a mural on a stucco. It had a kind of a textured stucco, a very not really possible to paint directly on. So came up with the idea of, plus I love wood blocks. <laughs> so it really was uh, about the idea of taking, you know, like a relief woodcut idea and doing it at large or in a series. And so that was a crazy idea, which ended up being a ton of work, but uh, it was fun. Well, the power, power routering um, uh, uh, mahogany plywood or um, yeah, outdoor, outdoor plywood and then painting it and sealing it and mounting it up in, in, a, in a sequence around the whole building. The idea was reflecting aspects of the environment particularly and of the cultural life that was happening therein. So those, those things came through in sort of symbolic form. And um, yeah, each one was a panel and uh, fairly, fairly large panels. So they were up for, I don't know, seven or eight years, I think. And, uh, and then in storage for a couple of years until the city hall was built. And so, as I say, then they were repurposed for there. So that's how that came about. Excellent. That's wicked. Uh, well, it actually looks like we are just, uh, we're just about done, actually. I don't think we have any time for anyone else. Um, but to, uh, to sort of, uh, close things off. I just wanted to uh, remind everyone that uh, these art talks are part of the First Thursday's Art Walk, uh, which this year is all online as pretty much everything is. Uh, so if you go to westvanartscouncil.ca slash First Thursdays, uh, you'll find a list of all of the participating uh, gallery and organization venues that are doing virtual exhibitions that are a part of the Art Walk, um, which will include the Arts Council's exhibition, the library's exhibition, uh, an exhibition from the West Van Art Museum, the Ferry Building, and the North Shore Artists Guild. Um, and it will also have a link to the Culture Compass. Uh, and also Taryn will be sending out that uh, amazing uh, 
uh, resource list with all of those links and anything else we've mentioned uh, this evening. So I think to, uh, to close things off then, um, how about uh, each of our panelists, why don't you tell us about a particular piece of public art uh, that speaks to you in, in some way? Anyone can jump in and go for it. <laughs> Anyone? <laughs> <laughs> well, Laurie, do you have a favorite? Well, I can talk. Well, I, can speak. I, I, can speak. I mean, I, of course, like I said, for me, you know, hey, I'm going to hold up my guide. I mean, I have 150 artworks that, that I, I really, for one reason or the other, you know, I like um, this one or that one. I, I, I sort of at the beginning pulled up the two that I, I thought, oh, I could focus on for this for this um, uh, process. Um, but I have, um, I, I just have to say Lynn Valley, I'll give a plug, Lynn Valley has some new artworks that were just installed and uh, people want to go see something really interesting and they're headed to say Lynn Canyon or something for a walk. Stop in by the mall and you're going to be greeted by some really interesting new bronze animals that are really worth worth having a stop and having a look at. Uh, so that's a hint. I'll give you a little hint on something. I would just say that um, for me, and I've thought about this a lot when I saw the question, it's, it's interesting, certain days I'll say, I love that piece and it really speaks to me. Like I really like the uh, community piece in Victoria Park, which is about children that have passed. I'm not sure of the name of it, Laurie. That's Enduring Love. I was out scrubbing it this morning, so it looks great right now. I must have felt that. <laughs> yeah, I just find that when I'm in kind of more of a thoughtful mood or, you know, uh, pouring rain, I just find that piece is really, it's just like very meditative and very thoughtful with all the pathways with the names and poetry in it. But then other days... I might really enjoy that camel, you know. <clears throat> Some days I might say, what's that camel doing there? <laughs> you know, and then another day I might go over and, and look into those big soulful eyes. So, so for me, that's what's interesting about public art. I, it's not like I have one or two pieces. I think that's why it's so important to have a lot of public art. And, and it speaks to, to people who are struggling with their day or, or need some inspiration. I think my favorite is that when I come across a piece that I didn't know was there and it's just this um, little you've explored and you've you've found it and it's just then I can thank Lori for uh, one of the people that makes our community such a special place to live in. So thank you. Oh, that's sweet. Thank you. <laughs> I, love job. I love my job. Yeah, I also like like uh, just to throw this in there. Some of the temporary pieces that went up through the Biennale, Sculpture mm -hmm. Biennale, Mariana Bakanovich uh, figures on Lonsdale, for example, and North Van, and I mean, some, some in West Van as well, I'm pretty sure. But um, yeah, I like the ones that at the ship, uh, along the waterfront that you had shown. Uh, Rick Henry's piece down on the waterfront, that's an earlier one, sculptural piece. I think it's at the entrance to the gate, uh, to the uh, park on the waterfront, right? Um, yeah, but yeah, as you say, it's when you find one that you didn't know it was there, that's particularly fascinating. And, you know, we, we don't know all of them that are out there, right? No. But uh, it's uh, it was nice to see them as surprises in the urban landscape. And I think that's uh, some of the best places for art to pop up is where it's not really like showcased in a prominent way, but it's just like almost hidden away beside railway tracks or, you know, somewhere more kind of in, inconspicuous almost, and then you just discover it. So uh, yeah, I like that kind of art too. Have you all been enjoying the little painted rocks kids are doing and leaving everywhere? I yes. find them in the woods and I find them on the street. I love it. Yeah, yeah. Those are great. May I just ask a question, Taryn and Stephen? If, if there are questions from the public, maybe uh, you could email them to us if there's no time now. I'd, I'd like to respond. If, would that be a possibility? Oh, maybe there's definitely. nothing. No, maybe definitely. Yep. Yeah. Okay, great. Sure thing. Excellent. Well, thank you to our 
uh, wonderful panelists. This was uh, very insightful um, and, and very broad, but also uh, inspiring conversation. It was, it, was, it was pretty amazing to hear everyone's thought on a topic that I don't think uh, all of us necessarily think about. You know, we all kind of, as I've been said, has been said this evening, you might just walk by something and not even think of it as being art. Um, or maybe you walk by something every day and it kind of gives you that little, that little smile that you, that you needed and, and seeing behind the scenes of how all that comes to be for, for our wonderful community is, uh, was pretty great to hear. So thank you very much. And, uh, and thank you to uh, everyone who showed up, all of our wonderful attendees uh, who are out to support the arts and artists, that's, that's wonderful. Um, and then another thank you to the West Vancouver Community Foundation, uh, whose support for the first Thursday of our project uh, has been tremendous and, uh, and we really couldn't do it without them. So thanks again, everyone, and uh, hope you all have a, a wonderful rest of your evening. And uh, remember to check out all of those uh, virtual art galleries and, and go have a, a, a peek at some of the art in your, in your neighborhood. Um, you don't have to go into a gallery. It's all around us. So thank you very much and uh, stay safe uh, and stay inspired and stay creative. Um, have a good evening, everyone. Thank hey. you. Thanks. Okay, thanks. Thanks for having me. Bye, Stephen. Karen, thanks for hosting. Thanks, guys. Thank <laughs> thanks you. Thanks for hosting. Okay. Thanks. Okay. Bye. Bye-bye.